Well, as we uh, continue our worship in the Word this morning, let's take a moment to bow in prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can meet together as a family to worship you, to celebrate you, to thank you for Jesus and what he means to us and what he's done for us. Father, as we continue our worship in the Word, we look to you. You are our only hope. And uh, we pray, Father, that your Word would be a light into our feet, a lamp into our path to guide us and direct us. Lord, what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, and who we are not in Christ, we ask that you'd make us. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, being a parent can be challenging at times. It makes me think of a mother of eight who uh, was talking with her friend one day and she shared, you know, that the kids were just so noisy this morning that I lost it. I threatened them. She said, I told them that the next person to scream in this house is going to get their mouth washed out with soap. She then added, you know what, just a few, few moments later, I got to tell you, I can still taste the soap. Being a parent can be challenging at times. James Dobson, in his book, The Strong-Willed Child, writes this about the challenges that can come. Just as surely as some children are naturally compliant, there are others who seem to be defiant on exit from the womb. They come into the world smoking a cigar, <laughs> complaining about the temperature of the delivery room and the incompetence of the nursing staff and the way things are run by the administrator of the hospital. They expect meals to be served the instant they are ordered, and they demand every moment of a mother's time. As the months unfold, their expression of willfulness becomes even more apparent, the winds reaching hurricane force during toddlerhood. Being a parent can be challenging at times, yet this morning what we're going to take some time to talk about is how we as parents, if God has called you to be parent, has, uh, calls us to rise to the challenge of raising godly children in a world that is growing increasingly hostile to the things of God and His Word. And so I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 4 to 9 together, and we're going to be taking some time to talk about how we are instructed as parents to raise godly children in an ungodly world, in a world that's growing increasingly more hostile to the things of God and His Word. You know, to raise children in the world that we live in is a challenge on the minds of many parents. There, it's a challenge on the mind of us as we think about raising our kids in the world we live in. Yet it's the same challenge that the children of Israel were facing as they were entering into the promised land. God knew as he's given these instructions that as they entered the promised land, where, uh, which was the land of Canaan, uh, there were plenty of temptations. There was the temptation towards sexual immorality and spiritual idolatry. But God also knew the only hope that the children of Israel had to overcome the pagan influences of the cultures around them were committed parents who were going to teach and preach God's word to their children and pass on their love for God onto the next generation. This morning, we're going to take some time to talk about how we are instructed to do the same. Deuteronomy chapter 6, would you stand in honor of the reading of the word together? Verse 4 reads this way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of the Lord, y'all may be seated in the presence of God this morning. If you're a parent this morning, how are parents invited to um, raise godly children in an ungodly world, instructed to do so. How can we as parents, how is it possible to uh, lead and influence and shape the spiritual direction of our children while they're in the home, while we still have opportunity to, to, to lead them in the path that they should go and pass on our love for God and his word to the next generation? We're going to see a few things this morning. The first one is by making 
our relationship with God our top priority. The best way that you can pass on your love for God and his word to the next generation is making your relationship with God the top priority of your life. You know, before we go into verses four to five and talk more about the details of it and the context in it, I'd like to suggest this morning that as parents, we cannot pass on what we don't already possess. As parents, if we are going to pass on to our children a love for God and a love for his word, we we can't pass it on if we don't possess it. You know, when I think of what we pray for our children, our, our prayer is that our children would come to the age early, that they would see their need for Jesus. Our prayer is that our children would come to a faith that is genuine, that they would not just see their need for Jesus, but receive the forgiveness he offers in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Our prayer is that they would walk in the power of the Spirit and that they would share their faith with as many people as possible. But I can't expect to pass on to them what I don't possess myself. And so this morning, we are to make our relationship with God our top priority. And verses four to five give us three ways that we can do that. First, by hearing what God's word has to say. The text begins with a command, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You know, that command to hear is an introduction to the confession that's going to be made in a moment, and it introduces the importance of it. It's so important to know that the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and so it's introduced by this command to hear. But the command to hear isn't simply a command to listen, it's a command to obey. When the command is given to hear, it's a command to heed, it's a command to align ourselves under the authority of the one being described, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and we are to align ourselves under the authority of the one true God. And so when we're hearing, we're being told more than to hear, we're being told to obey. You know, similar to a parent who walks into the room, sees that their child is watching television, should be doing their homework, and You may go up to your child and say, excuse me, I'd like you to turn off the television and I'd like you to go do your homework. And if they respond to you by ignoring you, your next statement will probably be something like this. Excuse me, did you hear what I said? Now, when you ask that question, did you hear what I said? You're not asking them if they listen to what you said. You're asking them if they're going to obey what you said. When God says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the command is to heed it. The command is to obey it. The command is to align ourselves under the authority of the one true God who's being described here. Hear, O Israel. And as parents, we must listen to the word of God. We must hear the word of God. And we must value reading God's word out loud. You know, as a church, we do that. On Sunday mornings, we stand in the honor of the reading of the word, not just because it's tradition, but we read the scriptures because there's something powerful about simply reading the unadulterated truth of God's word. Now, in a sermon context, I have the opportunity to explain it and to talk about how it applies to our lives, but there's something special and unique about simply reading the word of God and his parents who are going to pass on to the next generation a love for God and his word. We can't pass on what we don't possess. My prayer is that the parents represented in this room would have such a love for God and his word that they would hear it, that they would share it out loud, that they would read it and reread it and hide God's word in their hearts. And so first, how do we make our relationship with God the top priority of our life by means of hearing what God has to say in his word? Secondly, by getting to know the God of the word. The text says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This morning, we're invited not simply to know about God. We're invited to know God personally. How many of you know that it's one thing to know about somebody, it's another thing to know them personally and intimately and have that kind of relationship with him, and that's how we are invited to know him. What do we need to know about him? That the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Three things. First, the Lord is personal and knowable. The first word there is the Lord. You'll see it in all caps. And in the Hebrew, it's the covenant-keeping name of God, Yahweh. 
And that name is significant because it reminds us that God is the God who has revealed himself personally to the nation of Israel. He is not just personal, he is knowable. He is the God who makes covenants and he is the God who keeps his covenant, makes promises and keeps his promises. In Exodus 3, 13 to 14, we see where the origin of that comes. It says, then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am, Yahweh. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. You know what God was revealing to the nation of Israel? He was revealing that he was a personal God and therefore a knowable God. Because he's personable, personal and knowable, he's a God who makes promises and he's a God who keeps promises. As parents, we are invited to have an intensely intimate and personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. Because as we get to know him personally, we can then share him with the next generation, with our children and our children's children. First, we're told that the Lord is one. The Lord is personal. Secondly, the Lord is relational. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. We're reminded that God is our God. When the nation of Israel is saying this confession, they're being reminded the Lord is not just a personal God, he's a relational God. We are his people and he is our God. What a wonderful thing to, 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 to be able to talk to people and say, I know the God who created heaven and earth and everything in it. I know God who created me and created you and he desires to have a personal relationship with you and you can have a personal relationship through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord and it's a reminder that he is personal and he is relational and thirdly, he is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. When it says one there, it's speaking of the Lord in terms of his uniqueness and his oneness. His uniqueness in the sense that there is no God like our God. You know, as the children of Israel were preparing to enter into the promised land, the land of Canaan, there were many within the the, within the, the inhabitants of the land who worshipped multiple gods and goddesses. And there were plenty of temptations for spiritual idolatry, but the children of Israel were to affirm this confession, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is the one true God. There is no one like our God. When we're talking about our God, it served really as a polemic against all of the other gods that the other nations has worshipped. Our God is the one true God. He's the God who created heaven and earth and everything in it. He's the one who created us and has given us purpose. We worship the one true God. This morning, the question is, that is that your confession? Is that your profession of faith, that you know the one true God because you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? So it speaks of uniqueness, the incomparability of God with anyone else, that he alone is God, but it also speaks of oneness, that our God is one. Now the question is, well, does the is the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, consistent with this? And what we see is yes. Throughout Scripture, we see in, in Texts like John chapter 10, verses 30 to 31, Jesus tells us, I and the Father are one. One God, three persons. The one true God exists eternally as three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're one in essence, distinct in person, equal in glory. Now, when Jesus made this statement, let me read it to you. He says, I and the Father are one. And do you know how the Jewish leaders responded? Because they know a text like Deuteronomy chapter 6, and they perhaps made this confession, as they do even today. Devout Jews will say this verse two times a day. They knew it, and then Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And you know what they do? This They pick up stones in order to stone him. Why? Because they're saying, you are claiming to be God. Now, if Jesus wasn't really God, they had a right to stone him. But the fact is, Jesus is who he claimed to be. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is one with God.
God. These three persons, one in essence, distinct in person, equal in glory. Oneness refers to uniqueness. Oneness refer, I mean, um, one, one refers to oneness and uniqueness. And so that's what we need to know about the Lord. And so prioritize your relationship with God. Make your relationship with God your top priority by your knowledge of the God of the word. Not just know about him, know him personally. By hearing God's word. And then thirdly, by loving God. By loving God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Isn't it a wonderful invitation that we've been given as God's people and as Uh, Those who follow him, especially as parents who are going to pass on our love for God and his word to the next generation, we are invited to grow in our love and devotion to Jesus. My prayer as each day goes on and each year goes by, the longer that you're a Christian, that your love for God and your devotion to God would grow stronger and stronger that you would be able to say more and more about who God is and what he means to you because you have been walking with him as long as you have been walking with him. Now, there are three capacities that this text gives us for how we can love God with all of our heart, mind, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. But before we go into each of those specifically, I'd like to suggest it's meant to be taken as a whole. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength means that we love the Lord our God with everything we have. With everything that is within us, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, that he would be our number one pursuit. He would be our number one desire and our love and devotion to him would be what we desire to pursue most. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. The heart is, can be referring to the, the seed of the emotions. It refers to the place where your priorities lie. When we're talking about our heart, we're talking about where our affections are directed towards. Last time we were together, we were in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21 that really describe this. It says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be as well. Last time we were together, we talked about how, how we make financial decisions reveals a lot about where our heart lies. Is our heart set towards eternal things or temporal things? So what we're reminded to love the Lord our God with all our heart is to set our heart towards eternal things. To set our heart towards Christ and him crucified and invest in the eternal over the temporal. Matthew 6.33 put it this way. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That comes in the context of worry. The reason we don't have to worry is because our hearts are set upon Christ. And we know that he has everything that we need and there's no reason to worry. And so to love God with all of our heart is to set our heart towards him and know that we don't have to worry about anything. He takes care of us and we seek to serve him. Set your heart towards heaven. Set your heart towards serving Christ and him crucified. Secondly, love the Lord your God with all of your soul. Your soul refers to um, the invisible part of the body. It speaks of your mind. It speaks of your will. And so you're to love God with your thoughts. Meditate on the truths of his word. Your will is to be submitted and surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ who rules and reigns over all things, but rules and reigns over your heart, your mind, and over your life. So we're reminded that we are to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So Matthew 6 verse 4, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. We're reminded that Jesus also talked about this verse in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 to 40. As one asked, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. 
If you want to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you pursue that as your top priority, that's how you fulfill the rest of the law. Now, none of us have the ability to fulfill the law perfectly. That's why Christ came. He fulfilled the law perfectly. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And in Christ, we have the righteousness of God given to us. But we're reminded our number one pursuit should be to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. This morning, if you want to be a parent who passes on your love for God and his word to the next generation, make your relationship with God the top priority of your life. You can't pass on what you don't possess. I'd like to give us just a a few practical ways to do that. The first is this. Read God's word to your children out loud, especially when they are young. You know, when your children are young, if you're in that age and stage, it's a reminder that you may not take time to read the whole of Romans to them on a particular occasion. Maybe it's a particular verse that you can talk with them about, but as they grow up and they grow older and they come to understand different things, you can point them to different scriptures. The the time to point them to God's word and read it out loud is when they begin to read. What greater book? To let them read than the word of God. And so it's a reminder to read God's word out loud to your children, especially when they're young, but not just when they are young, as they grow older. Take time to read God's word as a family. As they grow up, as they grow old, even as they leave the house, as you come together as a family, we're going to take a moment to sit around the table and simply read the word of God. First uh, Timothy 1, 1, 4 through 5 reminds us of the benefit of that. Paul talking about Timothy and the relationship with his mother and grandmother says this, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. Never underestimate your influence as a parent. Never underestimate your influence as a grandparent. Just read God's word out loud to your children and see the impact that it's going to make. Secondly, share your testimony with your children. You know, when God is the top priority of your life, don't you want to talk about how you came to faith in Jesus? Don't you want to testify of how he's working in your life this past week, this past uh, 24 hours? Don't you want to talk about and testify of the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Um, Our oldest is six years old, and I got saved right around six or seven. And it's always a wonderful thing to, in this season, to say, you know, when I, about when I was your age, I was thinking about who Jesus is and trying to discern for myself is, do I need him? What does it mean that he came and died and rose again? What is the gospel all about? And I get to share with her, listen, when you're ready, you can accept Christ as your Savior and Lord. It's the best decision I ever made, and it forever changed my life, and it can change yours. This past week, my sister was in town, and so uh, as we were doing our bedtime routine, I called my sister in, and I said, hey, why don't you hear her testimony? And she got to share her testimony. She got saved around six or seven. And then I told my sister, hey, why don't you tell our girls how they can receive Christ as their Savior and as their Lord? And she began to share it with them. And my daughter said, you know, she makes a lot of sense when she explains it. And I said, well, <laughs> well, good. And so it's a reminder, share your testimony with your children. Have others share their testimony with, their, with your children as well and see the difference that it makes. Thirdly, look for opportunities to serve God as a family. Whether you have young children, children who are growing older, spend time ministering for the Lord as a family. Sometimes we've got different folks within the church who who want to serve in the ministry in the season that their children are in. If it's children, if it's youth, whatever season that may be in it, and that's okay. As you serve alongside of your children, it's a great blessing. Um, We had the skateboard outreach over the summer. And the skateboard outreach was a a fun time for our church. For those who who were able to pray, for those who were able to come out, we just had a a lot of volunteers help cook and interact with different people. And I knew that we had more than enough people to take care of all of the ministries going on. I was thinking, how can I make a difference? What can I do? And I was thinking, this would be a great time to bring my girls around and pass out some gospel tracts. And our children's ministry has 
made these little gospel tracks that are crosses and Amanda Graham who helps lead the kids as they get to sew these and so we took a, a pile of these me and my two girls and we just got to walk around and tell different people our children's ministry makes this and I got to tell our girls we can tell as many people as we can about Jesus and boy were they excited to take the little gospel tracks and and give them to people and people were like yes let me have them these kids are super cute you're not so cute but these kids are super cute and so I want to receive a gospel track and they can read about the gospel in it what does that look like for you and your children in the season of life that they're in what does it look like to serve alongside of your children and then thirdly set the right example for your children while you still can I was reading this, a little girl with shining eyes and a little face, face aglow said, Daddy, it's almost time for Sunday school, let's go. They teach us there of Jesus' love and how he died that we might all have everlasting life by trusting in him. Oh no, said Daddy, not today. I have worked so hard all week, I'm going to the woods and to the creek. There I can relax and rest. I must have one day to rest, and fishing is fine, they say, so run along, don't bother me. We'll go to church some other day. Months and years have passed, but Daddy hears the plea no more. Let's go to Sunday school. Those childish years are over, and that Daddy is growing old. When life is almost through, he finds time to go to church. But what does daughter do? She says, oh, Daddy, not today. I stayed up almost all last night, and I've got to get some sleep. This morning, we're reminded, set the example for your children while you still can. And it's never too late to begin. Whether your children are in the home or out of the home, it's always a reminder, as long as God has given you the opportunity to speak God's word into their life, as you make God the top priority of your life, it's never too late to start. And so first, how do we raise godly children in a culture that's growing increasingly hostile to the things of God and his word by making our relationship with God as parents the top priority of our life. Secondly, by means of hiding God's word in our hearts. Hiding God's word in our hearts. Verse 6 tells us this, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. What commands are we talking about Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so we're reminded that we are to hide God's word in our heart. That is the summation of the law. And, and if you pursue your obedience to, in obedience to the Lord to hear it and to heed it, you are going to be greatly blessed as you hide God's word in your heart. This morning, I would like to suggest that there are three evidences that tell us that God's word is hidden in our hearts. And these are, will help us and challenge us. First, when God's word is in your heart, joy will be on your face. When God's word is in your heart, it will impact the way you, 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 you show your, the joy of the Lord that's on your face, even as you interact with your children. When you wake up in the morning, you know, sometimes we're cranky, right? Sometimes our children wake up a little too early on the weekends. I've, I had that before. And then as they wake up, you can easily be in a cranky mood, but we're reminded the day's the day the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. If, if the word of God is in your heart, it's going to be reflected by the joy on your face. I don't know about you, but when I'm eating my favorite foods, my face shows it. When I'm eating my favorite desserts, my favorite, I mean, people know it. How much more as we taste the sweetness of the goodness of God and as we read the sweetness of the truth of God. 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. Secondly, when God's word is in your heart, worship will be on your lips. In Nehemiah 8, chapter, chapter 8, verses 5 to 6 is, the walls are rebuilt in Jerusalem after they come back after the Babylonian captivity and Nehemiah is leading the rebuilding of the walls and then they're going to dedicate the walls and they're going to dedicate the people back to the Lord. Here's what it says. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen and amen, while lifting up their hands and in response to the word, they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. 
This morning, as parents, if the word of God is in your heart, worship is going to be on your lips. I want to remind the parents in the room, especially the fathers, you are worship leaders. You set the example of what it looks like to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Not just giving lip service to the Lord, but giving your heart to the Lord. This morning, we're reminded, especially if I could talk to the fathers in the room this morning, as the spiritual leader of the home, you set the tone of worship. Even when we're gathered together in a corporate gathering, your children are watching you. And if you feel as if you can't worship the Lord openly, how can you pass a love for God and his word and worship to him to the next generation? This morning, as fathers, I'd encourage us to to be the worship leaders who set the atmosphere of worship and say, this is a priority, and God means so much to me. What Christ has done on the cross means so much to me, and I'm going to be worshiping him forever and ever. I want to worship him with my everything. I want to love him with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know, my father uh, came to Christ later in life, and so when he came to faith, he married my mother, and We were raised in a Christian home, if you want to put it that way. We were in church whenever there was church. I mean, three or four times a week. And when my father came to church, and he wasn't wasn't the best singer, but he was always the loudest singer. (laughs) And it was sometimes embarrassing because, you know, certain... We were raised at the First Baptist Church of Wilcox, Arizona, and some songs you would sit down, some songs you would stand up. My father stood for every song, and we're thinking, what is he doing? But the reason he stood, not to cause distraction, but because of what an impact Jesus Christ had made in his life, he was going to sing praises to his king. And I can recall in my mind a father who loved Jesus so much. If the word of God is in your heart, the worship is going to be on your lips. Thirdly, if the word of God is in your heart, obedience is going to be evident in your life. Psalm 119, 9 through 11 says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments, your word. I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. As parents this morning, we are invited, all of us, to hide the word of God in our hearts. And so, First, (laughs) make your relationship with God the top priority of your life. Secondly, hide the word of God in your heart. And now that you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, now can you pass it on to the next generation for generations to come? Lastly, we are to pass on our love for God and his word first by teaching God's word diligently. The text goes on to say in verse 7, you shall... Um, You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. To teach your children diligently, that Hebrew term there is literally to sharpen them. Why do you need to sharpen your children with the truth of God's word that pierces their hearts? Because they're getting ready to enter into a world with values that are contrary to the truth of what God's word has to say about them and what God's word has to say about other things. And so we, we are reminded that we need to teach our children the truths of God's word to sharpen them because what will allow them to overcome in the face of a culture that's growing increasingly more hostile to the things of God and his word is having the word of God in their hearts. And so we teach them diligently. Teach them diligently. You know, to teach your children diligently means that you are, you're stimulating their appetite for the truth of God's word. You know, as your children grow up from little to, to be able to, to grow up and, and to understand more of the truth of God's word, you're introducing them to different scriptures and truths about who God is and about who Jesus is. And they have a greater, or we want to stimulate a, a greater appetite for God and his word. One of my favorite things about being a parent of of, of, of these littles is as they grow up and you get to, especially the babies, once they become toddlers, you get to introduce them to new foods. Our youngest, Elijah, he, he's one years old now. And I still remember the first time we transitioned from milk to some kind of food. His favorite was sweet pota- potatoes. And boy, his face lit up when he got a sweet potato. Later, we got to introduce him to bananas and bananas were his favorite. His fa- but the best 
that he enjoyed the most at the time were avocados. Boy, we introduce him to avocados. When he, we just show him the avocado, he start going crazy. He'd take that avocado, put it in his hair, be eating it. He was having a joyous time. And then when he turned one years old, right before we had a little bit of a photo shoot, and he got to taste cake for the first time, and now he's got an appetite for cake. This morning, we're reminded we're to, 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 to stimulate the appetite of our children towards healthy foods. In the same way, we are to stimulate the appetite of our children for the truth of God's word. As, as we fall in love with the truth of who God is and what the word has to say about him, that we would talk about God to our children in a way that they would say, I want to know him more. I want to dig into the word of God more. Stimulate the appetite of your children. So teach them diligently. Secondly, teach them consistently. Teach them consistently. In verse 7, it says, and you shall, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. This text tells us that you should actually have conversations with your kids regularly, consistently, that you should talk with your children regularly, not just about their everyday activities, but about the truths of what God's word has to say. And so it says, talk with them when you sit in your house, maybe at dinner, maybe before bed, maybe early in the morning. You take some time to consider what those strategic opportunities are to sit in the house and talk with your children. When you walk by the way, you're going to the grocery store, dropping your kids off at school, going to a sporting event, you have opportunities to talk to your children and get to know them on a deeper level. When you lie down and when you rise up, before bed you can talk to your children and say, what's on your heart today? What's burdening you? What can we pray about to help you in terms of what, what you're facing? Relationships? What do you, what do you, schoolwork? What's on your heart right now? And take some time to talk to them about when you rise up, when you wake up in the morning, as we said earlier, sometimes your kids can be a bit cranky. So you woke me up a little bit early and be reminded today's the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. When God's word is in your heart, worship is on your lips. So the first thought of the day is, Lord, thank you. I'm just blessed to have breath in my lungs, to have health in my body. I have another day to worship the Lord with everything that I have. And so worship the Lord consistently. You know, sometimes folks will come and say, hey, what's the best parenting book out there? There's a lot of parenting books these days, a lot of books on marriage and family, too many to count today. We have way too many books on parenting and, and, and family, but, but we're reminded the, 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 the best book that you have is the truth of God's word. And the reason why no book is perfect is because all of our children are different. No one has come out with a book on your child No one has come up on a book on your children, but your job as a parent is to know your child. That's why when you're talking with them consistently, you're getting to know them, what their needs are, what the burdens of their hearts are, how you can pray for them. And as you get to know them, as they enter into new seasons of life, you can literally write your own parenting book specifically about your child. And as you get to know your children and talk with them consistently, what ends up happening as well is you discipline them consistently. As we talk about parenting, the question is, what does God's word have to say about discipline? I'd like to share a few things that help us. Proverbs 13, 24 reminds us to discipline consistently as we get to know our children and talk with them consistently. Proverbs 13, 24 says, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Discipline should be done consistently. Discipline should be done early. Proverbs 19, 18 says, chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. While your children are still able to be shaped, those are the times when you discipline your child and when they grow up and they get a little bit older, it might be a little bit more of a challenge. You know, my sister, this is a little off topic, but my sister was here this week, I said, and and she's got a dog, and she told me in dog years, the dog is 21, and she wants to start disciplining the dog and to train the dog. I said, it was too late. 
You should have trained it when you first got that dog. Now you said it's in dog years, 21 years old. Discipline while it's still early. You know, 1 Samuel 3.13 reminds us of a priest named Eli who had sons who didn't discipline his children as he should have. It's not that he didn't, he just waited too late. 1 Samuel 2.25, it says, if, if, a, if one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. So he did correct them. But then in 1 Samuel 3.13, it says, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. He did not discipline them. He did discipline them, but he did so when it was too late. This morning, we're reminded to discipline early. Thirdly, this morning, discipline strategically. Discipline strategically based on the bent of your child, and you have to get to know your child to be able to do that. Some may ask the question, what's most effective, corporal punishment or verbal punishment, verbal instruction? Well, the scriptures seem to endorse both, but it's dependent upon the bent of our child. When you get to know your child in certain circumstances and cases, do you punish them in regards to corporal punishment or verbal punishment? Proverbs 23, 13 to 14 says, Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. The text in regards to what Solomon is saying is Solomon is not endorsing child abuse. You should never injure your child if you're going to discipline them. You should never abuse your child or, or punish them in a, a moment of anger. We're going to see in a moment we are to, we are to discipline them from a place of love. That's the, the purpose. But what the text is telling us is that in terms of discipline in a corrective way, in a loving way, not an abusive way, will not hurt your child. It will bless them. And what you desire to do is to break the kind of defiant will that will lead them on a path of destruction and ultimately death that will lead them away from God's path for their life and a personal relationship with Jesus. And so as you get to know your children, you discipline them as you understand them. But then in Proverbs 29, 17, it says, correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. When it says correct there, it's the term that doesn't refer to um, corporal punishment, but verbal instruction. And so as you get to know your children, sometimes in regards to the bent of your child and what they have done, you Discipline them verbally, or you may discipline them in terms of corporal punishment. But discipline your children strategically, and then lastly, discipline your children lovingly. Proverbs 11, 3, 11 to 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. If God really loves you. He will discipline you. If you don't see the discipline of the Lord, it's a question of God. What's going on? I need the discipline of the Lord in my life. How much more are children? If you really love your children, you will discipline them God's way. James Dobson writes this. The parent must convince himself that punishment is not something that he does to the child. It is something he does for the child. His attitude toward his disobedient youngster is this, I love you too much to let you behave like that. You know, as a parent, as you, as you talk about God's word consistently with your children, you do so in discipline. And as you get to discipline your children, you say, there's a scripture for that. And I want to take you to God's word. I want to take some time to pray with you. And I want to do my best to raise you in the way that God wants you to be raised as God has given me that role and that responsibility. And so we are to teach diligently, teach consistently, and then pass on that love to the next generation. He continues to write, you shall bind them, God's word, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now, um, many devout Jews even today have taken this literally. They've got uh, these boxes with God's word in them, and they put it on their heads and they wrap their hands with these. 
I'd like to suggest this morning what this means when you put it between your eyes. It means God's word is in your mind and it's in your heart. As you teach God's word diligently and consistently to your children, as God's word is in your heart and therefore on your lips and you're living out the truth of God's word, it begins not just to be a part of your heart and mind, but it becomes part of theirs and they get to know the truth of God's word. Verse nine, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, make God's word such a priority in your house. Such a priority in your conversations that when you're going about your work, you see God's word on your hands. That God's word's such a priority that it's in your mind and downloaded in your heart and it's being talked about as often as you have an opportunity to talk about these things. If there were just a, a few takeaways, I'd give you these. The first one is pass on to the next generation a love for God and his word. I want to share this. A man once argued with the English poet Samuel Taylor Cooleridge about the place of religious instruction in parenting. I don't think parents should indoctrinate their children with religion, the man contended. Instead, they should give their children the freedom to make their own choices. You hear that a lot in today's culture. You know, don't, we're not going to force our children to go to church. We're not going to force them to do this religion or that way. They can choose for themselves. Cooleridge did not say a word, but instead invited the man to his backyard to look at his garden. The visitor exclaimed, this is no garden, it's just a patch of overgrown weeds, Cooleridge replied. Well, it used to be a garden, but I decided to give it the freedom to become whatever it chose without any interference from me. Our greatest role and responsibility as a parent is to influence and shape the spiritual direction of our children to present them the truth of what God's word has to say. And it won't necessarily guarantee whether our children, because they're, fr they're free to choose as they will, but our job and our role is to share the truth of who God is with the next generation. We are to pray for them. Perhaps there are some here this morning with, with prodigal children, and you're continuing to pray for them and you were faithful to pour the truth of God's word into their heart and into their minds. You talked about God's word as you left the house and as you talked along the way before you, you rose up during the day and before you went to bed and that word is still in them and you can continue to pray that God would bring them back to himself. And so let us continue to pray for our children Schedule time to explain the gospel to our children. Commit to leading our children to Jesus. You know, one of the greatest blessings we have as parents is to tell our children about who Jesus is. And then lastly this morning, ask God for help. I'll close with this illustration. You know, when, when we, uh, our first child was a preemie, and so she was, she's now six years old, but when she was born, she was in the NICU for 40 days. And so being in the NICU for 40 days, she was just three pounds when she was born. She was about four pounds when she was released 40 days later. And the night before she was released, they invite the parents to come to stay at the hospital. And it's almost like a, a try it out night, you know? And so you sleep at the hospital and they give you your child. The only thing is when the, those babies are in the NICU, they give them like Tempur-Pedic beds and, you know, they give them pillows. Like when you take them home, you can't, you know, those pillows, you know, no blankets or anything. They treat those babies well in that NICU. And so that night, I'll tell you, it was the worst night of our lives. <laughs> I remember not sleeping a bit, waking up in the morning, and then me and my wife were looking at each other, and we were like, we're not ready. We're going to tell them, I think she needs to stay a little bit longer, but the nurses were like, no, you're taking your baby home. And we were like, okay. And I remember that night, we said, God, you're going to have to help us. And we're continuing to ask God for help every single day. And I look forward to continuing to rely on God for help as our children grow older. Continue to ask God for help. Can we take some time to pray? Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for what it has to say about parenting and the principles it's, it gives to us to instruct us and to guide us, Lord. And, and I just pray, Father, that um, you would help us to be the parents that you've called us to be. I, I pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct us with your word. I pray for every parent in the room, myself included, that 
my love and our love for, for God and his word would, would grow. Our, our devotion to, to, to God would grow stronger and stronger. And Lord, Father, that we would be able to have the opportunity to pass the truths of God's word on to the next generation for generations to come. Father, as we look ahead into the future, we may have concerns or worries. And I pray, Lord, knowing that you're sovereign over all things, that you would help us remain faithful to what you called us to do and then surrender the rest to you. Lord, you're going to take care of this next generation as we do our part. And we pray, Lord, that our children and our children's children, as long as Christ tarries, as long as he doesn't come back, we pray, Father, that they would be faithful to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Father, we're grateful for our time together. If there's anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus and wants to make a public profession of faith here today and and say, Jesus, I, I wanna make you Lord of my life, I pray that they can express this to him. Now, Father, I recognize that I need Jesus. I've missed the mark, I've fallen short. I know that what separates me from a holy God is my sin, but I believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. 2,000 years ago, he came from heaven to earth, died in my place, rose three days later after dying in newness of life, and now I have the opportunity to receive the gift of salvation, eternal life, and the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is my Savior. He's my Lord, the one I'm going to follow all the days of my life into eternity. Father, thank you again for our time. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.